How's it going guys? Stack King here again with another week of Dark Power. Before we get started, as always, remember to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. We appreciate it. Getting straight into things, we're going to go right to Carnyland. Carnyland was a pretty kind of straightforward episode this week, kind of just talking about the different back and forths of people who are running for mayor. As they discussed last week, somebody was going to drop out of the mayoral race, and as we found out, it was none other than Nick Aldis with kind of a fake uh, news scandal uh, of bad press pol politics, as it was, uh, as it were. And that's just how politics goes sometimes, right? People can be forced to, to lose races or drop out of races at the drop of a hat, depending on what the scandal is. But Carneyland moves forward, and replacing Nick Aldis is none other than Tim Storm. Tim Storm is now running on the Strictly Business Party, which I'm not sure how that would work because Tim Storm hates Nick Aldis. Nick Aldis hates Tim Storm. <laughs> but we'll see what happens next week when the mayoral election starts. Okay, guys, we're going to go to AEW Dark now. AEW Dark had a boatload of matches 11 if my count was right a huge slew of matches let's jump straight in starting this off and actually a really good match to start off a show was a trios match between dress jazz express and capital vices and i think with john cruz i don't think he's part of capital vices i think it was capital vices with john cruz but really great firecracker of a match uh solid work between with everybody involved dress express picks up the win great way to start the show. After this, they continue with tag matches of SCU versus Brandon Cutler and Peter Avalon. And here we have another good tag team match because it's classic SCU. It's Chris Daniels and Frankie Kazarian. Normally it's now Kazarian and Sky, but right now we're going to have Chris Daniels and Frankie Kazarian reuniting, we'll call it the Bad Intentions subgroup of SCU, as it were. But this is a match where maybe it's going to be Cutler and Avalon's chance to shine, chance to pick up that first win. But alas, SCU, they'll SCU you later if you, if you think that's what's going to be happening. After this, we have Big Swole versus Danny Jordan. Danny Jordan, as you remember, is the mean girl. She has the burn book. Good character, good character work in this match, using the book in the beginning, trying to get under the skin of Big Swole. Big Swole picks up the win. After this, we have Lance Archer versus David Ali. Now, okay, I gotta say that the first time that Lance Archer came out to the ring, you know, beating somebody, not related to the match, but beating somebody up and tossing them into the ring, beating them up some more, and then tossing them out of the ring. It was good. It was a good, it was a good kind of thing. The problem is doing it every single time he comes out. That's just his entrance. It just doesn't, I don't know, to me it doesn't work because I'm just, oh, okay, yeah, he's beating somebody up backstage. Nobody's able to stop him from doing that. Nobody's telling him, hey, Lance, if you continue to do this, management's gonna fine you. At least if they if they did that or they had the commentators talk about that, then it kind of makes sense. Otherwise, as far as I'm concerned, I see a, a, a locker room where the management and the refs and all that have absolutely zero control over what's going on backstage and that just doesn't to me that kind of there's a disconnect it's kind of the same thing with uh cody's entrance where it's always well at least back in the day it was the chandelier rising up and he comes out from there if you do it every time it kind of loses the effect of it to me it just becomes Cody's entrance. If you save it for special moments, big matches or big er matches, even if they're TV matches, then that kind of adds a certain genesis quad, like a certain I can't describe it, but it but it adds that presentation, that pageantry to it, right? But I mean, the match itself really good in the sense that Lance Archer is going to beat the crap out of this person. This person is going to get the crap beaten out of them, and that's that's exactly what happens. After this, we have Joey Janela and Sonny Kiss versus Musa and Sean Dean. Solid tag match here. I like what they're doing with Janela and Kiss. We've talked before about the stacked AEW tag team division, where they're going to go from here. I don't know, but at least they're doing something with them, right? That was the issue with Janela 
uh, earlier, and that was the issue with Sonny Kiss almost, is that they had really nothing for him. So the fact that they're actually having matches and having tag matches better than not being used, at least they're getting that TV time to develop and get more popular with crowds. After this is... To me, probably either the best or second best story match in that it's moving forward storylines, it's developing characters, and it's pushing towards down the road. And that is a tag match between with Brandy Rhodes and Ali versus Red Velvet and Kenzie Page. Red Velvet and Kenzie Page are completely inconsequential to this match. Could have been anybody. Could have been any, any, anybody. That wouldn't have mattered. The real point of this match is what's going on between Brandy Rhodes and Dustin Rhodes and Allie and QT Marshall, right? We kind of have been covering the story. I'm not going to get into the rehash of everything that's been happening. But here, we have a situation where... Due to a miscommunication, Brandy collides with Allie, who is in the corner, waiting for potentially waiting for the tag. Allie feigns injury to her leg for after this because she takes a hard fall off the rope. Because of this, Brandy is forced to uh, face face the fight, fight on her own, and she is going back and forth with Red Velvet and Kenzie Page, having to handle all of it on her own, but she's doing that. She's finding that strength to do that, doing what she needs to do. Allie comes in at the last second and steals the pin of the win, and it kind of gives you the idea that Allie was never actually hurt. She's just make, pretending to annoy Rhodes. After the match, uh, Allie tries to shake hands. She tries to shake hands with, with Brandy, but Brandy's not having it. They get into a little bit of a shoving match. They gotta be separated. The storyline that's happening here is they're progressing it, right? They're moving it forward, they're getting development, and to me, that's something that's really important about moving dark matches or AEW dark matches beyond simply just dark matches, right? So I like that they were able to do that. After this, another match that has to deal with storyline or at least character development, Sean Spears versus Lee Johnson. Now we're seeing what's gonna happen with Sean Spears. He's got the glove, right? We want to see what's going to happen with physicality. We want to see what's going to happen with his desire to win, whether or not that there's going to be a change. And there is, we're starting to see that. He's going to put Lee Johnson in a submission hold. He's going to win by submission. He's not going to give up the hold. He's going to keep hold, keep grabbing that hold. So we're starting to see Spears gain a little bit more viciousness starting to see him care less about his opponents. Not that he cared at all to begin with, but now it's more of a physical thing. Before it was just like a mental, he just, you know, dismissed them. Now it's not just that dismissal, it's I'm dismissing you and I can beat you up. And that's an added facet to it, right? That's what that glove is for. So good, good, good on them there to kind of progress forward with Sean Spears and see what they can do. After this, we have a match with Dark Order versus Brady Pierce, John Skyler. This is a relatively, to me at least, it was quick tag match. Not that, not that crazy of a match. Dark Order's picking up the win. We know Pierce and Skyler aren't going to get that win. After the match, Brody Lee comes out, does his Brody Lee's like weird smile thing, and we're flying because we know where Dark Order's going with here. We see that this is now getting Evil Uno and Stu Grayson. Back into the mix, just as they did with other uh, tag teams that came back. Private Party, Butcher and Blade, Superbad, and uh, Superbad Death Squad. Uh, they were more developing, but teams that were coming back from Pandemic, we see that, that this is kind of the hallmark of how they're building them back up. So good on them to continue that development. After this, speaking of the Superbad Squad, Jimmy Havoc versus Griff Garrison, who I believe is making his AEW in general debut. Uh, solid match. Havoc bleeds. Havoc was getting that blood, tasting the blood, reinforcing that deathmatch aspect of it. When he, when you're going to get busted open, or if you're going to get busted open on the hard way or intentional, uh, either way, it's good when you have somebody like Havoc who 
that is in his character, that is in his wheelhouse. He knows what to do if that happens. So solid work. Again, speaking of <laughs> super bad squad, now we have Penelope Ford versus Skylar Moore. This is a solid match. I appreciated the fact that Penelope Ford and Kip Sabian came out with their dog. That was kind of a cool, just little aspect of it that, you know, they're like, either it's a, it's one of those nonchalant things, like, we're not going to be here that long, so why ask somebody backstage to look after the dog? Apparently they can't because Lance Archer is going around doing horrible things to people backstage. Who knows what he would do to a dog? I don't know. Is PETA on set to make sure that everything's, everything's on the up and up? Who knows? Is a murder hawk going to attack a dog? I don't know. But either way, Kip Sabian and Penelope Ford say either this match is not going to take up enough time or it's just one of those things that they really love their dog. And there's nothing wrong with that. You should love your pets. I, lo I, I love that cat, Uno. Uno loves me. It's great. But Penelope Ford picks up the quick win over Skylar Moore with Britt Baker out, with Chris Statlander now out. May she recover as quickly as possible. May she get back in the ring as quickly as she can. I know people hate to be out of the ring if they don't need to be. And ACL tears, no fun, not fun to deal with. But that creates opportunity, right? So now Penelope Ford is going to be somebody who steps up. She was already going to be stepping up against Karashita anyway. But the possibility of them maybe dragging out the Penelope Ford, Hikaru Shida storyline and giving them more matches, there might be something there. So it, it'll be interesting to see how that develops and the fact that Penelope is going to be getting more uh, screen time is, I mean, she's got to, right? How many, not that Chris Stantlander is a heel, she was not by any stretch of the imagination, but how many heels, female heels, are there in AEW wrestling in the women's division? There was Britt, Nyla, Penelope, and she beat Nyla for the title, and Britt's out with the injury, which only leaves my ring finger, not my middle finger, my ring finger, and that's Penelope Ford. So unless they start bringing out more heels or turning people heels or whatever the case may be, and I believe that's why uh, Anna Jay is going to be getting a match on Dynamite, maybe to have her be somebody they can throw in the mix. Now that Statlander's out, you need to be able to push Penelope Ford pretty well. Finally, in our main event, the missing member of SCU, Scorpio Sky, faces Robert Anthony. Robert Anthony has now been in the main event two weeks in a row on Dark. I really hope that he is somebody that they're interested in signing. This is a firecracker match. I really liked it. Just as how you had a strong match in the beginning, they have a strong main event. I really like the match. But I'm also kind of a Robert Anthony guy, so maybe that's a maybe that's some of my inherent bias coming out. But really good main event. Matches I would look for if you are getting a chance to watch this would be the opening match, the Rhodes tag and Alley tag match, the Sean Spears match, and then the Scorpio Sky Robert Anthony match. All right, guys, we're gonna move on now to Impact Wrestling. Pretty good uh, episode of Impact. I gotta I gotta say. I liked the overall arching arc of an episode. Uh, that's always important. You have to have a, you have to have, it's little, it's little ups and downs. Maybe hills, we'll call them hills. Hills that are climbing upwards, building towards something. I guess maybe I should do it like this. I don't know. It, yeah, what? I don't know what I'm doing. What, what, what am I doing with my hands? Uh, no, the uh, you have to have stories within episodes of TV while you're building towards a pay-per-view. But that overarching storyline to the pay-per-view is important. But you have to have something for those two hours, three hours, however long your show is. Six hours if it's a Monday Night Raw. That's how some of them can feel like. But you have to have something, some hook from the beginning that gets resolved in the end. And here, what they're doing is they, from last week, and who is the person who attacked Trey of the Rascals? So now they're kind of developing that story further with the other members of the Rascals starting to, you know, ask people who did what, when, where, and why, right? They got to try to get to the bottom of what's happening. And there's going to be an interesting development in that. Two developments, actually. But first there's going to be a tag title match where the Rascals are going to face the North 
and it's a good match, just as how there was a good opener on Dark, good opener on Impact. Really important. And they deliver. This is a pretty good tag match. Uh, North picks up the win. Well, I, I, I know I know uh, uh, Ethan Page pretty damn well. Uh, he's the former freelance world heavyweight champion. Kylie, he's the one who Kylie Ray beat in a two out of three falls match to win the title. And Kylie Ray, who is now also on Impact. But Ethan Page is pretty good when it comes to in-ring talent, both on the mic and in the ring when the bell rings. Uh, Josh Alexander, I don't know as much about, about. I do know that they have been tag team partners for some time, both in Impact and outside of Impact. They're the longest reigning tag title holders in Impact's history, which is just incredible when you think about it. The rich history of Impact Wrestling when it comes to tags, when it comes to people like the American Wolves, Beer Money, LAX, there are a lot of quality teams that have happened throughout the history of Motor City Machine Guns, I almost forgot about them, but a lot of history when it comes to the Impact, TNA, GFW, whatever you want to call it, uh, whatever name they've gone under over the years, though that their tag title division and the fact that the North have been as dominant as they have been, kudos to them. They retain their titles, and after this, Rascals find out that Trey's been ambushed yet again. Now, it can't be the guy, it can't be Wentz, because he was in the ring. And we already had him kind of exonerated beforehand when Trey, you know, said to him as they were getting ready to come out for the match, I don't think it was you, we're all good. So Trey can't catch, Trey can't catch a break as far as I'm concerned. Who's attacking this poor guy? After this, we have Knockouts Division action, Nevaeh versus Kimberly. I think this is a match that would have benefited with a crowd. Both women had a tendency to yell a bit too much during the match, which, I mean, is probably fine when you have that crowd, but when you don't have that crowd, you have to adjust. And some of that is knowing, right? Knowing where you are. That's kind of the mark of a veteran in the set. Not, and not that these women aren't veterans, but just a mark of people who are veterans of TV. That's actually probably a better way to put it. Veterans of TV in that you understand how to work a crowd. Working a crowd for the benefit purpose of a live crowd versus a TV crowd are two different things. Because a live crowd, it really doesn't matter if it's just a show. If it's just like a house show or you know a show that you may go to at your local indie promotion, it really doesn't matter in that sense of how you do things. Meaning to say that if you need to kind of switch into more heelish tactics or switch into more face tactics, you can. Because unless it's a really, sh like, unless you're being booked multiple times in that promotion or you're really signed to that promotion, it doesn't really matter. The crowd is interested in a good match, good storytelling within that one specific match. And even if it's a house show, you, you have more room to do like a WWE house show for example you have more room to do kind of what you like it's more of a chance to experiment work out new moves work out sequences and things like that right and also the crowds are more attuned into those individuals because they've seen them be characters on TV so when you have TV tapings or just TV in general without a crowd you have to know how to adjust and as basic as it sounds, some of that is just sound quality, sound technicians, and knowing, hey, there's no crowd. If I'm going to do what I would normally do when I throw a punch or throw a forearm and that's yell at the top of my lungs, it's going to sound weird when there isn't people chanting or saying things all around me that muffles that sound so that only the crowd can hear it and the people at home are saying, okay, they yelled. But now when they're watching it, they're like, damn, they yelled pretty loudly. So it's kind of the thing that they may need to work on or just remind them, hey, you, there's no crowd here. Plan accordingly. After this, there's a match between Rhino and Rohit Raju. Rhino picks up the win. I kind of like the story that they're telling. It's a uh, young blood versus old guard kind of story. That's always it's always good when it's well done. And it seems to be, it seems to be going pretty well so far. The aftermatch tantrum that Rohit Raju threw, which Josh Matthews kind of alluded to as happening before before I, uh, <laughs> I started watching it, this uh, threw me a little bit. I was like, I don't know. I don't think it's... 
the the aftermatch tantrum to me doesn't work like at all unless there's something coming out of it in the sense of okay great way to compare and contrast we'll take two suzuki gun members minoru suzuki loses beats the crap out of the young lions right that's what he does if he loses he just starts wailing on people and i'm like okay that's a temper tantrum but it's reinforcing the fact that he is a vicious sob doesn't care about anybody and he can hurt people so in a way him doing that to the young lions puts over further the guy who just beat him because the guy who just beat him was able to take a beating from suzuki and still won whereas somebody like zack saber jr throwing a tantrum and he's just like in the rain he's like ah it's like all I don't, like, to me, I don't get anything out of it. I just think, okay, Zack Sabre Jr. is like a petulant child. So, the same thing applies here. I don't know if they really needed to do it, but they did. After this, there is a title defense, second title defense of the night, of the not really TNA World Heavyweight Champion Moose, who is the TNA World Heavyweight Champion Moose. He faces a TNA original of Hernandez, a previous iteration of LAX, if you were not aware, but Hernandez was a member of LAX back in the day, and actually at the time they had uh, the now Zelina Vega uh, involved in the faction. She, I always remember if she, I always forget if sh she was Sarita or Rosa, but she and the other woman uh, 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 who was part of LAX, they were TNA Knockouts tag champions at one point. But anyway, Hernandez faces Moose, World Heavyweight Championship match. Uh, pretty quick match, pretty solid match. A little bit of stumbling here and there, but gets the job done in the sense of proving that Moose is a little delusional about who he is and what cha what that title is. Apparently, he found it. It's not even something that he got from anybody. I didn't know that part until Josh Matthews brought it up. But I'm a little confused by it in that sense because where are they going with this? But that's what we find out almost right after the match. Instead of playing Moose's music when he wins, they play Trouble, 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 EC3's music. Now, EC3, recently released from WWE, could be one of the persons who is going to appear at Slammiversary. We don't know. Uh, by then, his non-compete would be exhausted, the 90-day non-compete. Depending on, I would see that's the thing. I, I would love to be able to read WWE contracts just to see what goes on in them and what is said. But the non compete, I'm assuming, would be done by July 18th, May 18th. No, July 18th, June 18th, May 18th, April 18th. Yeah, roughly around that time uh, is when they got when they were released. So there we go. That would make sense. But whether or not that is going to be EC3, we don't know. It could just very well be that they're playing the music because we know EC3 was released. They're teasing EC3 as one of the people who could be showing up. And it's going to be somebody else completely different or other people completely different. And it's not going to, EC3 is not going to be involved whatsoever. But they have the music, so why not play it, right? And that's smart. It's creating more mystery. It's creating that air of intrigue. Moose played it perfectly, saying, whoa, wait a minute. I know that song. Where is he? So I thought that was really well done. After this, there's kind of a funny uh, Deaners and Willie Mack promo setting up a six-man tag match for next week. We'll see who the mystery partner is. After this, there is a match between Reno Scum and XXXL. First time seeing these guys, I know who Ace Romero is. Not too big on the other part. Not too, don't know too much about the other guy. But these guys are freaking huge. Um, match was, I mean, what it was, Reno Scum picks up the win, not too much to write home about this match. After this, there is a promo video, a really good promo package with Diana Perazzo, kind of giving more backstory on where she was coming into Impact when she first came there many years ago, when she developed, how she developed, how she came up with this virtuosa persona, you know, what it means to be the virtuosa. That I thought was really well done. After the promo, they are talking to Jordan Grace. And before Jordan can really talk about what she thinks, considering Deanna Prazzo put her in an armbar last week, Deanna Prazzo attacks her again, puts her in another armbar. 
So they're definitely building towards Jordan Grace and Deanna Perazzo. Earlier, I will say that they had a little promo segment or backstage vignette with Smiley Kylie and Susie talking and Susie's like, well, I don't know, like maybe I should be bad as opposed to being good. Kylie's trying to keep her on the straight and narrow. Taya Valkyrie gets involved. They're like, whoa, I don't like either of you guys. I don't trust this Kylie Ray. No such thing as somebody who's good all the time. And that's going to be setting up a match for next week of Susie versus Taya Valkyrie. After the, after the Deanna Perazzo promo, we have our main event. It's a street fight between two of the five people who will be in that Slammiversary main event for the title. It is none other than Eddie Edwards and Ace Austin. These guys are definitely following the Stan Lee alliteration way of naming characters. Scott Stummers, Stephen Strange, Matthew Murdoch, Peter Parker, Ace Austin, Eddie Edwards. But these guys have a pretty pretty good street fight. It's hard. I will say it, it's hard in wrestling to present something that can be new sometimes. Uh, to present things that are able to be different. Just how many street fights have we seen, right? So it's good that they're trying new things. They're, they're trying to keep it fresh. They're trying to find a new way to put a spin on it, right? But as a main event goes, it was a pretty good damn main event, I got to say. Probably, I will say, my match of the night. Yeah, I, I would say my match of the night by far. Um, everything else was kind of just, you know, going along. This thing had that kind of extra factor to it, especially when you consider that they're jockeying for position when it comes to building momentum for that five-way match, which is only about a month away, so there's only a few more weeks of TV before we get to that pay-per-view. So you've got to be building momentum. You've got to be picking up wins to go into that with the best foot forward. Ace Austin picks up the win when Madman Fulton arrives. And because it's a street fight and anything goes, everything's legal, he's able to assist, give the assist to Eddie Edwards, and that's when Madison Rain puts one and one together and potentially gets two. We don't know yet, but she potentially gets two by saying that it was Madman Fulton who attacked Trey the first time and the second time. Who knows whether that's the case? We don't know. That's part of the story. That's part of the mystery. We need to see what exactly is Madman Fulton's reasoning for helping Ace Austin. So that's going to be something that we look forward to next week. Also next week, there's going to be a match between Cancel Culture and Crazy Steve. There was a vignette for Crazy Steve and Cancel Culture earlier in the show. I am starting to pick up more and more about what the cancel culture promos are, what what, what, what they are, what Crazy Steve is, uh, mentally unwell Steven, and seeing where they, where how this feud is being built. The, the the people within cancel culture seem a little off to me because it just seems kind of a hodgepodge of people just to have them have something to do. But hey, I'm willing to give anybody the benefit of the doubt when it comes to wrestling. Just don't you know. Just don't prove me right or wrong about how I, how I, my original take on it. So I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. It seems a little weird to me, but that is what it is. And Impact has done a pretty good job of being entertaining these past couple weeks as I've started to get into it. I'm learning more about the characters, learning more about the current storylines. I want to see where they go from here. So guys, as always, remember to hit the like button. Remember to hit the subscribe button. I'm wearing a LIJ shirt because... New Japan is finally back. I was watching the uh, first round of the New Japan Cup as well as the Together Special earlier today. Phenomenal work there, as always, with New Japan. So, guys, until next time, I'll catch you. Hope everything is well with you. Hope you guys are getting back into the swing of things with COVID and all that fun stuff that's going on there. Hope you guys are staying safe. And as always, hit the like button, hit the subscribe. Thanks for watching, and until next time, I'll catch you.